Hello and welcome to a midday connection here at First Presbyterian Church on Monday, April 11th, Monday of Holy Week. And uh, again, my name is Pastor Joel. Hi, I'm Natalie. And we thought that we would do, a, instead of a midweek connection for Holy Week, we thought we'd just go ahead and do one every day of the week uh, because I think it's just important to see how uh, God continues to speak with us, especially through um, holy days, but uh, every day uh, being um, a part of what God's plan is for our lives and for eternity. And so we will be reading today's daily lectionaries. During Holy Week, there are um, uh, festival day readings, but we're going to go ahead and continue to read with the daily readings because there are more Psalms and more Old Testament and New Testament readings. Uh, but I certainly hope that you will find them to be a blessing to you. Let me go ahead and open this with a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you for your word to us. I uh, pray, Lord, that we would be attentive to it and that our lives would be transformed by it. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to read your word. Uh, so I pray that your spirit would enlighten us to its meaning and that we would respond appropriately. We thank you and praise you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Starting today with Psalm 119, verses 73 through 80. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have humbled me. Let your steadfast love become my comfort, according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame because they have subverted me with guile. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me so that they may know your decrees. May my heart be blameless in your statutes so that I may not be put to shame. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all your people mighty deeds and to the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are fallen and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. From Lamentations chapter 1, 1 and 2, and 6 through 12. How lonely sits the city that was once full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night, with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers, in the days of her affliction and wandering, all the precious things that were hers in days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was no one to help her. The foe looked on, mocking over her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. 
She has become a mockery. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Her downfall was appalling, with none to comfort her. O oh Lord, look at my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Enemies have stretched out their hands over all her precious things. She has even seen the nations invade her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, and see how worthless I have become. It is nothing to you, all you who pass by. Look and see. If there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including all the saints, saints throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our consolation. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Jesus said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. And our final psalm today, Psalm 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul also is struck with terror, while you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. 
Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, again, this is a Monday of Holy Week, and so we've had an opportunity to read a couple different psalms than we ordinarily read and then see these passages. Um, and looking at these things from a, uh, from a Holy Week perspective, um, I think about the Lamentations passage and how Jeremiah, the writer of Lamentations, is, is making the, um, is, is describing the situation that's currently going on in Jerusalem. And back in Jeremiah's day, uh, Jerusalem was, um, even though it was the city where the temple of God was built, and even though this was the, the place of, of, of the Jewish, the capital of the Jewish land, uh, they were not doing the things that God commanded them to do. Jeremiah described some pretty, using some graphic language about how uh, uh, Jerusalem is acting like a, you know, for lack of a better phrase, a, a wanton woman doing things that, uh, that she shouldn't be doing and therefore is experiencing the shame and the, um, the destruction that ultimately comes uh, upon her in judgment and, and the righteous judgment that the Lord has put upon uh, the city and the inhabitants at the time. Um, but what I found interesting about Paul's words from 2 uh, Corinthians, how he's talking about uh, the, the hardships that he himself is suffering and how he says that if we are being afflicted, it's because of their afflictions and the consolations that they might experience are for their consolations. And just this whole idea that apparently um, in the way God interacts with people, that there is, um, in order for healing to truly occur, sometimes suffering must happen. And, and it's challenging because all of the Psalms that we were reading have that element in there, I believe, that this idea of uh, people knowing what is right and, and, and even endeavoring to do what is right, but then falling short of that and getting into a place where uh, they are being afflicted and, and rightly, uh, having um, consequences for their actions, uh, but but then how um, how how Jesus uh, through His love and through His mercy is able to bring about healing and wholeness even in the midst of those struggles. I don't know what you might want to add. To that. Well, and I think when you look at the Mark passage mm -hmm. and you see the response to Jesus and in that moment. Uh, when Jesus comes in and upends the temple and the people that were in power, rather than looking at that saying, look at what we've done, we need to have this change of heart, and looking at that, their response is, we have to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. And so instead of looking at that suffering and that consolation that we can, you know, we have that suffering and then that consolation we can find in Christ, and I think that's so often our human nature is to go, no, that he wasn't really talking to me though. <laughs> he wasn't talking to me. That's just that wasn't intended for me. And it's we try to find this other direction. And instead of turning back and looking at our own hearts and trying to figure out if there's a need there for repentance or acceptance right. or, or, or asking you know for forgiveness, whatever it is, our response to that instead of turning back to Christ is to discount that and to say, like I said, that wasn't us he was talking to. Right. And so you see the suffering in the Lamentations, you see the suffering in the Corinthians. And rather than looking up for a response to that or healing from that, it's, we look elsewhere. Mm. Um, I think, uh, I don't think many people, probably very few people get up in the morning and uh, say I want to cause problems in other people's lives. I don't think people are looking around for ways to be uh, uh, irritating or uh, you know whatever. I, I just don't think people are 
consciously thinking that. And so again, thinking about it from Jesus' perspective, he goes into the temple and he says, look, here are the words that's written in scripture that my house should be a house of prayer for the nations if you made it a den of robbers. I think the people that were selling in the temple probably had initially good intentions, right? You know, that, well, we're going to make it possible for people to offer the right sacrifice. We're going to make sure that there are uh, good uh, animals available that are ritually pure, whatever it might happen to be. Um, and then somehow in that, they, they, uh, they, they missed the point. And, and rather than recognizing that uh, the temple that God established, the, the place where God said that he was going to meet his people, ultimately Jesus himself, as described as the temple, he's there to reestablish relationship, but they get so attached to their little territory, their little form of living, their whatever might happen to be, and they miss the bigger picture. And I wonder if that's true of us. Uh, throughout our lives, you know, we can read God's word, and just like you were saying, well, that doesn't really apply to me. That's just those really wicked people that are doing those things, as, a, as opposed to remembering that there's there's a shortcoming in all of our lives, that there's sin in all of our lives, and uh, even though we might be justified in our own eyes, like, well, I'm certainly not as bad as that person, or I'm not even aware of how bad I might be because I can line stuff up pretty good in a lot of different categories. And when somebody steps out of that ordinary, um, how easy it is for us to cast blame on others. But then when Jesus, the holy of the holy persons, comes in and he's there and he just kicks them all out, you're right. And then they go, we've got to destroy him. <laughs> right, well, he's like, threatening their power. Right, he's threatening right. their, you know, who, who does he think he is? That's he that he mentality. Is. Right. Um, I'm a little bit uh, interesting about um, the whole fig tree parable. And I was trying to think about this earlier when I was reading this before our time together. But it says there in verse 13 that it was not the season for figs. Right. So how and can the tree be expected right, right. to how, produce? How is the tree at fault when it's not the season for figs? And then this whole... Uh, cursing of the fig tree and and I started to think about it maybe um, in a way uh, you know it, it's an analogy obviously that the fig tree can't do anything other than what the fig tree is supposed to do the fig tree can only bear when it's the season for figs but there are other passages in scripture that talk about how God established the people as a vine or a tree or something like that and I think ultimately there, there shouldn't be a season of faithfulness for us. We're supposed to be faithful. We're called to be ready. We are called to be um, regularly attentive to what God is calling us to do, responding appropriately. And so in a way, he goes into Jerusalem, he finds the temple where they're not being the house of prayer for all nations, where they should have been the house of prayer for all nations, that they weren't functioning in the role that God had intended for them, and therefore they get cleansed out, therefore the fig tree gets cursed and withered. And so um, I guess the, the question for us is, what is God calling us to do? All of the fruit that we are supposed to bear uh, through his spirit, you know, if we are not practicing love and joy and peace and kindness and faithfulness and generous, you know, and kindness, uh, and long suffering for others if we're not producing the fruit of the Spirit. And what, what really are we doing as Christians? And it's like, well, we're, we're coming up on Easter, and we know that there are going to be people that are putting on their Sunday finest, and that's, that's good, and we should be, and that's great. And I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of people come to church on Sunday, and this is a season of faithfulness. But like the fig tree, are we not supposed to always be producing good fruit? Are we not supposed to always be um, practicing those things that God has called us to do? You know, I'm glad that people do it on Easter. I really am. But the question is, shouldn't we be uh, increasingly obedient and faithful all throughout the year, all throughout our lives? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly glad that we uh, have the assurances that are offered to us in the Psalms and I'm certainly glad that if we were to 
you know, look back at all of the Psalms that we read today, but, uh, you know, I think especially about um, Psalm 6, how it does have that interesting combination of the discipline that comes from God, uh, but then ultimately the, uh, the, the, the healing that comes from God. That, uh, that, that God only disciplines those whom he loves. We know that also from scripture. And so in our own lives, are we, um, how do we respond to that? And so knowing that God's grace is sufficient, knowing that his healing is present, even in the midst of discipline, I think should allow us to continue to grow and find our full and total comfort in what God provides. Well, Natalie, do you want to close us in prayer today? Would that be all right? Yes, I'd be happy to. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, and um, thank you for your word. And sometimes it is a challenge, and sometimes it is um, difficult um, to hear some of the words that you have for us. But we know that you do love us, and that we can find rest in you, and that you are our comfort and you do want um, good things for us and that um, our faithfulness will lead us back to you and i just pray that as we are in this season of easter that as people may be uh, coming back or people may be coming for the first time in, in quite some time that um, that they hear your words and that they rest in your assurance and that their faith may be made stronger and that, um, that our faithfulness be made stronger. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. And if you do have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to give us a call and we'll be happy to see what we can do. But I hope you have a blessed day and we look forward uh, with God being willing that we can do this again tomorrow. Take care, bye-bye.